uh, we have our final uh, oh, penultimate Bible reading from James this week. Uh, so we're looking at James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. This is God's word. For those of you who have been on the youth camp, well done for getting here. That's pretty impressive that you've made it here from youth camp. You must be exhausted. All I ask is that you don't snore if you fall asleep. Um, But hopefully we'll keep it. It's a really interesting passage, so you don't want to miss this one. um, Because there's some difficult things here we're going to have to grapple with and uh, work our way through. So let's pray and ask for the Lord's help. Our Father, we are so grateful that we can gather like this. Uh, When we went through COVID and we were unable to meet together, how we missed the fellowship that we could enjoy together and the time just gathering to worship you as your people. So we are grateful that we once again have this ability to meet together like this. Help us not to take for granted this privilege we have. And as we grapple with your word and some difficult verses, we ask that you would give us insight and give us understanding. Help us not just to understand, but help us to integrate into our lives what you say to us this evening. May we have an encounter with the living God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. When I was much younger, and I'm going back a long, long time now, in my 20s, early 20s, and for those of you who are wondering, that was after Noah came out the ark. But when I it was in my 20s and um, was in a small town in South Africa, Peter Maritzburg, and I can't remember why I was there. All I remember is that I bumped into a friend and we were at a, a, a small field and it had a long um, shed on it. And I asked him what he was doing there. And he said to me, well, he was going on a parachuting course. And the course cost back then 110 rand, which was really very, very cheap. It was a student rate, and it included three jumps. And I remember sitting here thinking, you know, why didn't I sign up for this? Because it's one of my unfulfilled dreams to parachute. Um, And he was trained in the beginning of the weekend, and then the plane went up, and they got three jumps, solo jumps with a parachute on. And I must admit, I I remember thinking to myself, oh, I really, really wish that I could have done that. Now, one of the realities about parachuting, right, is if you parachute, you want to parachute. You don't want to jump from a plane 5,000 meters in the air and discover when you pull that ripcord that your parachute hasn't been packed correctly and it doesn't work or doesn't operate or you pull the cord off like that one James Bond movie where he rips it right off and the parachute doesn't open. Because at the end of the day, if your parachute doesn't work, you're dead. There's no coming back from jumping from a plane without a parachute or a parachute that doesn't work. It's indispensable if you're going to do any kind of skydiving. And so James, what James says to us in this, that parachuting isn't indispensable for Christian faith, but prayers. Prayer is the indispensable tool of the Christian faith. 
You cannot be a Christian and not pray. Pray is like breathing for us. It's the same as when you go scuba diving and you put on air and you go under the water and you breathe in that air. Prayer is air for us. It is our connection to God. And so James, as he begins to wrap this letter up, begins to instruct us not in everything about prayer, but in some aspects of prayer. And so you see this theme coming through at the end of this letter. Firstly, I want you to notice the continual encouragement to pray. Look at verse 13. The continual encouragement to pray. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. We'll come back to verse 14. Now, when he says, is any of you in trouble, the trouble to which he refers there is a very comprehensive term. It's very broad. It, it, it talks about misfortune, hardship, or distress. So if you're experiencing any of those things, then James says to you, the best place you can go to help you in those situations is to God and go to Him and pray. The same word is used in verse 10 that speaks about hardship that the prophets face. Now, when you read through Scripture and you go through a book like Isaiah or Jeremiah, for example, and you read of some of the trials that those prophets face, and Jeremiah, who in chapter 20 is so despondent, is so discouraged, is so at the end of the, his tether that he literally says to God, you know, you've, you, you've overpowered me. You, you've made life so hard for me that th this is impossible. If you go to Elijah, whom he will mention a little bit later, Elijah, who comes before God in prayer and says, you know, Lord, I actually would rather die. Have you felt like that? Have you got to the point where in your life where sometimes you've wished secretly that you'd rather be dead than alive in this world? That's the kind of situation that James is surfacing here, when the pressure is so great and your faith is so stretched that it feels as though you've come to the end of your tether and you just don't know where to turn or what to do. And James says, pray, pray. And the emphasis is not praying for the trial to be removed. Don't misunderstand what James is saying. Rather, what James is saying is pray that in the midst of your trial, you will experience the ever-sufficient grace of God who will sustain you and enable you to persevere even though you don't feel emotionally or physically or mentally up to it. Paul knows what that's like, doesn't he? Because he speaks about it in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Let me read the verses for you. But he said to me, now Paul has prayed, I sort of backed up, Paul has prayed three times that God remove this flesh, this, this thorn in his flesh. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation about what the thorn is. We're just not told. So we don't know. What we do know is that it's caused a significant problem in the life of Paul that he has prayed continually and asked God to remove it. And God says, no. This is what he does say, though. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's conclusion, therefore, as a result of my understanding of what the Lord is saying to me, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Do you get that? In his extreme weakness, Paul says, I will rest in Christ because he gives me the strength to endure the trial that I'm undergoing, even though it feels as though it's so harsh that I want to give up at times. Or, Paul writing to the Corinthians in the first letter, 
when he reminds these Corinthians <laughs> that there is no problem too great that you will be lumped with that God won't enable you to endure. I'll read the verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand under it. This is God reminding us that under the burden of trial, temptations come and they come hard and fast. And he says when you are tempted under trial to do something that would be inconsistent with your faith, know this, God will not allow you to be pushed so far that your faith will break. But when you are being pushed and you are being stretched, God will provide a way out, not by removing the temptation to do whatever it is you want to do, not by removing the trial, but He will find a way that you are able to stand up under it. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in weakness. And then He encourages His readers to sing songs of praise when things are going well. But what I want you to see when he says that, when he ex ex exhorts them to sing songs of praise, here he's not talking about singing songs of praise just because they're feeling happy. But rather he's saying, allow your happiness, your contentment in your relationship with Christ in spite of the circumstances that you're in, allow that to drive you to sing songs of praise in the midst of your trouble. Now, that's much harder, isn't it? And things are going well. It's easy to sing songs of praise. But here, when you are going through difficult times and trouble, and to allow your heart, the cheer of your heart, because of the relationship we have with Jesus, to drive you, even in those circumstances, to praise. In other words, this isn't a superficial Christianity that... James is talking about. This isn't a Christianity that you jump in because it's just going to be things going well. But rather, this is a robust faith that says, in spite of the difficulties, I will rejoice. And as Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 4, what does he say? He says, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice, writing from prison. Or, as he writes to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is God's will for you in Christ. Now, that's not easy. Let's be honest about that. That's not easy. But that is what is being encouraged here. And Paul is trying, uh, rather James is trying to remind us that whatever you face with, whether it's good or bad, pray, praise, turn to the Lord, find comfort in Him. So I don't know what your circumstances are right now. You may be going through a good period. Thank goodness for those periods in life. But you may be going through a difficult period right now. And your faith may be under severe pressure. And you may feel like giving up, and you may feel perplexed, you may feel sad, you may feel stretched. And God's encouragement is pray, pray, pray. Secondly, I want you to notice the confident assurance of prayer. Look at verses 14 to 16. Now, these are very, very interesting. We're going to take our time to to understand what he's saying. The confident assurance of prayer. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now listen to verse 15. Because this is unambiguous. And I want you to hear the words coming out of this because so often this is watered down or it's altered or it's changed to try and take away the force of what's being said here. Listen carefully. And the prayer offered in faith, that's by the elders, notice, not by the person who's sick, but by the elders who have come to pray, 
will, not may, not possibly, not maybe, will make the sick person well. The Lord will, not may, will raise them up. Let me just pause there. Now you sit with a problem, don't you? What's the problem? Well, the problem is we know that God doesn't always heal, does he? We prayed for people. I've prayed for countless people who have been sick, many, over the years of pastoring. Most of them have gone to be with the Lord. So is that what James is saying? Is James saying that if we pray and we call the elders when a person is physically ill, that is guaranteed that they will be raised up? Well, if he is saying that, there's a problem, isn't there? Because our Christian experience says, well, that's just not true. So what, what, what some scholars try and do is they try and jump around. And they try and say, well, well, you know, maybe it's if it's being prayed in the, the will of God, th then they'll be healed. But he doesn't say that, does he? There's nothing about praying in the will of God. It's just saying in the prayer offered in faith, will cause the person to get well. So there's a definite about this. And so we need to ask ourselves the question to answer the problem that is faced. What does he mean by sick? Is he talking about physical sickness? Or is he talking about some other kind of sickness? And the word is interesting because in the original language it has two possible meanings. It can either mean to be physically sick or to be spiritually weak. Now I want you to think about this. Either physically sick or spiritually weak. What has he just spoken about in the preceding context? He's spoken about the poor who are being exploited by the wealthy. And that they must come and that they must bring their case before God. That they must be patient, that they must stand firm, that they must hang in there because God sees what's going on. And then he follows that up and he says, if you've got trouble, and that word for trouble means uh, th 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 those of you who are struggling with problems that are related to your faith, pray, come to God. Now he comes on to the next section. And he says, if you are sick, in fact, if you are spiritually weak, if your faith is fading, if your faith is under pressure and that faith is starting to fall apart, the word used there should have been translated, is any of you spiritually weak? Is any of you spiritually fading? Is any of you having a crisis of faith? For that fits the preceding context and then the succeeding context. What's the succeeding context? If you need forgiveness, ask God for forgiveness. Is that a physical or spiritual problem? And the healing is guaranteed, right? If you confess, and you will be forgiven. So the whole issue that James is dealing with here is spiritual. It is faith that is under severe pressure and has got to the point where the person who is under that pressure no longer can even pray. That's how bad it is. They've got to the end of their tether. The word that he uses there for sick, kamnonta, uh, in verse 15, literally means to be weary, fatigued, weary in soul, discouraged. So even the following word in terms of the sickness that is being used by James is speaking about the condition of the soul. The soul is sick. The soul is weary. The soul is discouraged. And the person has reached such a point in their faith that they no longer can turn their eyes towards heaven and pray. That's how spiritually depressed they are. And if you've been a Christian long enough, You've been there. You've been there. I know I have. Where life has become so overwhelming, the difficulties have become so great, and spiritual depression sets into the soul that it's so hard to pray. And so James says... 
bring the elders. Why the elders? Well, let me ask you a question. What is the main responsibility of the elders? Spiritual oversight of the church. The spiritual servants of the church. So it seems natural, logical, if this person is struggling with their faith spiritually and the soul is weary and depressed, what do you do? You call those who've been given spiritual oversight over the church and you ask them to come to the home. And you ask them, as the spiritual overseers of the church, to pray for the person whose faith is wavering. It's just logical, isn't it? And they come, and they pray in faith that God will revive the soul. And James says the assurance you have is when they pray, that person will be spiritually revived. The soul will be restored. Their faith will once again rise up. They'll be healed spiritually. There's no ifs and there's no buts. There's no if they've got strong enough faith, if it's the Lord's will. No, James is much more strong than that. And the only way to come to a logical position in this text is to understand it as speaking about a problem with faith. If he were talking about physical healing, then the person would be guaranteed recovery. But we know that's not true. And either James means what he says and says what he means, or he doesn't. And what's the previous verse in verse 12 said? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now James is not saying, well, you'll be healed and then suddenly you're not healed physically and there's something wrong here. No, no, no. This is all to do with our spiritual state of affairs in our heart. So let's not tiptoe around this text. Let's not try and do exegetical somersaults to try and squeeze it into a context that just isn't there. It's just not. And the anointing of oil, that word that is used there in that phrase, will be like the anointing of oil, is a participle. Now, no, I don't want to give you an English lesson, but you will know that a participle serves, if I can put it like that, the main verb. What's the main verb? Pray. So the participle James is using metaphorically in the Middle East, they often used oil as a soothing balm on those who are unwell. And Paul, uh, James is saying the prayer of the elders will be like a soothing balm, like oil, like anointing someone with oil. It will be a soothing balm to the soul. It's metaphorical. It's not meant to be understood literally. And then they will be raised up. That literally means, the word is erige, uh, egere, sorry, in the Greek, egere, if you're interested, means a renewing of one's spirit that has become weary. In other words, it's a return of the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength, says Nehemiah chapter 8. I can't remember the verses, 37 or 39. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Or in Psalm 51, verse 12, this is David's prayer after he sinned with Bathsheba. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's down in the dumps. He's committed adultery. His son has died. And he's confessing. And he prays and he says, Oh God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's what James is speaking about, being restored spiritually. And for that reason, do you see, he goes on. And he says, therefore, uh, sorry, if, if he has sinned, second part of verse 15, if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Now, why on earth would you throw that in if it was physical healing? 
Because Jesus has already made the point that not all physical, physical uh, uh, sickness is a result of sin. In fact, it's terribly destructive when people go and pray for those who are physically sick and then say to them, there's some sin in your life, that's why you're sick. Sometimes it is a result of sin. It's very rare. Sometimes it is. But in most cases, it's got no relationship to sin. We live in a broken world. We are subject to bodies being broken down. We are subject to sin. We are going to experience the effects of sin. And that means that sometimes we are going to get disease. God doesn't say, I'm going to just protect you from all disease. No. See, this is in the context of a person perhaps who is grappling with some sin. And that sin perhaps has overwhelmed them to the point where they feel too guilty to pray. It's too hard to pray. The sin is too great. And so James says, if that is your situation, if that's the cause of your sickness, your faith sickness, then confess your sin. Lay it out before the Lord. Tell him what it is so that you may be restored. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. There is the assurance of forgiveness when we confess our sin. God is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The problem is not so much that you and I can't come to God. We can come to God. The problem is our own minds that work against us. And particularly if we've been grappling with a repetitive sin. I remember sitting down with someone once, and not in this church, a long, long time ago, over 18 or 19 years ago, who had been involved in multiple adultery relationships and just said to me, Ian, I can't pray. I just can't pray. I'm just, I'm too bad. I'm too, I'm too bad. And that's more an indication of his understanding of the forgiveness of God than it is of the forgiveness that God will give to those who confess their sin from a repentant heart that is broken before him. So if there's sin, confess. Bring it to the altar. Bring it to God. Allow the forgiveness that restores our relationship with God to be experienced. Allow the faith to be revived. Now it may be that there is someone here in that situation. There's a sin in your life that is preventing you from praying because you feel depressed and burdened by it. It's been overwhelming. And maybe you need some help. Maybe you need the elders to come around. Maybe you need to confess that. Maybe it needs to be a confession in front of the spiritual overseers of the church. Maybe you can do it just privately. But what I want to assure you of this evening is that God is a God who forgives when we confess our sin and when we repent. And maybe your problem tonight is not related to a sin. Maybe you're overwhelmed by a situation that is facing you and you're finding it really hard to pray. Can I encourage you, invite the elders to come, that we might come as a group of men commissioned by God to pray for you, that God would restore your faith, restore the sickness of your soul, and bring you once again into the joy of his salvation. Is that you? Don't hold off. And then thirdly, I want you to notice the comforting effectiveness of prayer. Look at verse 16b. Therefore confess the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question, why does he raise Elijah? Why does he bring Elijah into this? What is it about Elijah that causes him to think of him when it comes to a righteous man? 
Well, the point that James is trying to say is that prayer is not just something for the spiritually elite. It's, it's not as if those super spiritual people, only the elders can pray. Or only the ministry leaders can pray. Only the pastor should pray for me. You know, they're the spiritually elite. No, James is saying, listen, you can all pray. You're all on the same level when it comes to prayer. There's no such thing as super spiritual or not so super spiritual people. We have been renewed by God through His Spirit. We have been made alive spiritually. We have direct access to God through Christ. He is our mediator. We are able to enter into the throne room of God. And you don't, you don't have to be a super spiritual Christian to do that. You just need to be a Christian. That's it. And why is Elijah used? Because Elijah had terrible fainting fits of faith, didn't he? After he had that incredible experience on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, where the prophets of Baal have been defeated and God is answered by fire, the very next thing that happens is Jezebel sends a message and says, Gee, I've got, you on, uh, I've got your head, I'm going to have your head on my plate. And she tells Elijah that he, she is after him and she's going to take his life. What does Elijah do? He's had this incredible experience on Carmel. He runs. He runs. And he runs for about 120 Ks. And at the end of that, he's exhausted. He's at the end of his tether. And he comes before God under that in the desert and he says, Lord, just, just let me die. I've had it. I've had enough. You see, Elijah like us can be frail. Elijah like us can have fits, fainting fits of faith. Elijah is normal. But... Elijah is also a man who has a zeal for God. When he's in that cave and, and the wind passes by and the storm passes by, and then there's a still small whisper to Elijah when God speaks to him and God encourages his soul. You see the zealousness of Elijah coming through, saying, Lord, I'm the only one left. I've been fighting for your name again and again and again. And, and all the other prophets have just caved in and I'm the only one left. And God says, actually, I've reserved for another 400, so you're not alone. But you can see that heart that is after God, a heart that is, that is after God's glory, wanting to see the end of idolatry in Israel, wanting to see the people worship God. Here is a man who is committed to God. Yes, he has fainting fits of faith but he's also zealous for the Lord. And so he takes Elijah, a great example, because we see the two extremes. And he says, you and I are like that. Elijah once prayed to die. Not once, but twice. And then when God meets him in the cave, he's still depressed. He still doesn't get it. And God revives him. So you and I, if we have a passion for God, a zealousness to glorify Him, to honor Him, to serve Him. And we go through periods in our lives where our faith is weakened through circumstances. Take courage, because you can pray. Just like Elijah. Literally, it says, in prayer... Elijah prayed. That's a literal translation. In prayer, Elijah prayed. In other words, there was a persistence to his prayer. He kept on praying. He never stopped praying. And when we take a, a quick walk through the Bible, we don't have time to do that this evening. And we look at people like Moses, David, Abraham, Jacob, well-known, famous men. We see the same thing again and again and again. We see ordinary men and women who sometimes are very frail in their faith, but who love God in spite of that frailty. And so we are just like them. Don't put Abraham on a pedestal as though he's up here and you down there. 
ground at the cross's level. Let me close with a true story that might bring this home. Visitors to the famous gallery in St. Paul's Cathedral, London, can hear the guards whisper travel around the whole dome, the sound bouncing back many times from the smooth walls. If you put your ear close to the wall, you can hear what is said on the opposite side of the dome, even though it may be said in the lowest of tones. I wish I'd known that when I went there. Mind you, we got there so late that it was such a rush. And then Stephen had to go to the toilet, so that, that interrupted us getting everything done. Sorry, Stephen, don't mean to embarrass you. It wasn't his fault, it was our fault for not doing, getting him to one earlier. And he was only a young, young boy, nine or ten, I can't remember. A number of years ago, Paul Shoemaker whispered to his young lady that he could not afford to marry her, as he hadn't e enough money to buy any leather and his business was ruined. The poor girl wept quietly as she listened to the sad news. A gentleman on the other side of the gallery, which is 198 feet across, if you challenge with feet, that's about 65 meters across. That's about the width of a rugby field, for those of you who just want to put it in terms to understand. Heard what he said. When the young shoemaker left St. Paul's, the gentleman followed him and after finding out where he lived, had some leather sent to the shop. He was delighted when he discovered he had some leather. He made good use of the gift and his business prospered so that he was able to marry the girl of his choice. It was not till a few years later that he learned the name of the unknown friend. It was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Britain. Gladstone, who had done that. And then he ends, There is always one above who hears our whispered sorrowings and prayers and will take action. No matter how low we whisper, he hears. We cannot always tell our human friends about the things, but God always knows. So we can tell him all in prayer, and he will hear and he will answer. So can I encourage you, pray, whatever your circumstances. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Keep on praying. You may not get an answer straight away. Three years for Elijah. Keep on praying. Don't give up. Don't allow the burden to so overwhelm you that you finally throw your hands up in exasperation and say, that's not, I'm not praying for it anymore. Hang in there. And if you can't pray, if it's too overwhelming, give me a call. Get on the phone. And I'll organize the elders and we'll come around and pray for your faith. It would be our privilege and joy to do that, to encourage you, to help you to be restored back in your faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word that is so encouraging to us tonight. Maybe there is someone here whose faith is right at the precipice. They're right at the end of their tether. Maybe they're finding it very, very difficult to pray right now. I want to ask that you would enable them if they feel that way to have the boldness to call so that we who have been given this incredible responsibility of spiritual oversight of this church may pray for them so that you might revive them. For you have promised that the prayer offered in faith will raise them up, will restore them spiritually, will bring the joy of your salvation back, will heal the soul that is sick. And I pray that you would enable us for whatever we go through in this life always to turn to you whether it's in good or bad times 
and to pray and to praise you. For Jesus' sake, amen.